chapter twelve of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain a revelation the vicar has called to tell us that delphine has made up her accounts and that the fet has cleared fifty pounds more than the smaller affair last year he seemed pleased and proud and i was delighted too and immensely relieved because i had really been horribly afraid there would be no profit at all curious to think where all the money came from to pay heavy expenses and still clear so much it just shows how small sums add up i asked if delphine were very pleased and he hesitated and said she seems tired feeling the reaction no doubt she worked so hard an imp of curiosity tempted me to see if he were really as blind as he appeared she made a splendid hostess and didn't she look charming too i am sure you were proud of her in that lovely new frock his eyes softened with a deep glowy look which was reserved for delphine alone i am always proud of her she always looks charming but the dress i'm afraid i must plead guilty i know nothing about her dress really truly you couldn't tell what it was like not for a thousand pounds i stared at him frowning if i had a husband i should like him to know i should be furious if i made a special effort and he didn't even notice that i had anything new he smiled with a forbearing air surely not i think better of you miss wastneys dress is altogether unimportant not to me not to your wife there are some women to whom it is the greatest temptation in life he looked outraged disgusted and changed the subject with a resolute air but i was glad that i had spoken a husband can be too unworldly and lost in the clouds it would be the best thing in the world for delphine if he did notice and that in more ways than one in the afternoon charmion and i called at the vicarage to congratulate delphine and found her distinctly the worse for wear pale heavy-eyed and inclined to snap a very different creature from the radiant butterfly of three days ago she was glad to see me however i was someone to snap at which was what she wanted most at the moment and she worked off quite a lot of steam hectoring me about things i might have done better or not done at all and impressing on me for future occasions that i should be less independent and take more advice she likewise informed us quite incidentally and by the way that mrs ross had disliked my hat and mrs bruce had asked if charmion were anemic such a colourless skin and mrs someone else thought it so queer that we should live together although she behaved like a spoiled ill-tempered child but she looked so young and worried and pretty through it all that on the whole i felt more sorry for her than myself as for charmion she smiled with an air of listening from an illimitable distance which i can quite understand has an exasperating effect on people who do not understand and care it exasperated delphine now i saw the blue eyes flash and the pink lips set with a peevish desire to hit back mrs bruce said her family know the fane family quite well they come from the same county she was telling them about you but of course not knowing your husband's christian name made it difficult she thought it so queer to have your own christian name printed on your cards did she said charmion blandly it is an american custom i put in hastily i should do the same if i had such a fascinating name i wouldn't delphine said it's so queer unless of course one's husband had a hideous name elisha or jonathan or something like that even then one might leave it out i shouldn't dream of marrying anyone called elisha what was is your favourite man's name jacky said charmion naughtily delphine's eyes flashed 
was that your husband's name oh no the pink lips opened to ask a further more definite question but it died unsaid the steady gaze of charmion's eyes prevented that she would be a bold woman who could defy that silent challenge we made our escape and walked home in silence charmion seemed very depressed and went to bed at nine o'clock next time i see delphine merivale i shall tell her plainly that i will not have mrs fane annoyed with questions about the past last night we dined at the hall last night things happened we started feeling quite festive and excited for after a strictly domestic life for nearly five months it becomes quite thrilling to dine in another house and to eat food which one has not ordered oneself as we drove along the lanes we amused ourselves like schoolgirls guessing what we would have and who would take us in charmion as the married woman would obviously fall to the squire i hoped that i should be at the other end of the table with a partner who was sweet-tempered and appreciative bridget had come back from posting a letter bearing the thrilling news that the squire's car had been to the station to meet a party of guests two fine upstanding ladies and a gentleman with a figure like a wooden noah in the ark the shoulders of him that square you might have cut them with a knife it was refreshing to know that we were to meet people who did not live within a radius of five miles i rather hoped those shoulders would fall to my share they did he is an american i might have guessed that by the description and one of the fine upstanding ones is his bride and they have been doing england for a few weeks before starting on a year's honeymoon in the east the explanation of their appearance at the hall is that they chanced to have met the squire years ago in america and wished to renew the acquaintance so things came about mr elliot is an interesting man and like all americans loves to talk about his own country he was pained and shocked to hear i had never crossed the atlantic until i told him that half myself in the person of an only sister had gone in my place i was just going to add that charmion had also spent a great deal of her life in the states when something stopped me one of those mysterious impulses which at times lay a finger on our lips and check the coming words charmion sat on one side of the squire mrs elliot on the other i was half-way down the table sandwiched in between a dozen comfortable middle-aged worthies who were all intimate friends if not actually related to each other and their conversation though interesting to themselves was not thrilling to an outsider i saw the american's quick eye dart from one to the other and hoped he was not classifying the company as typical english wits the dinner itself was long heavy and unenterprising a victorian feast even to the specimen glass decorations one rose and one spray of maidenhair in a tall thin glass before each separate diner charmion and the squire talked and laughed together and seemed quite happy she is a lovely creature when she is animated there is a dainty charm about every movement which makes her seem of a different clay from human creatures even to see charmion eat is a beautiful thing all the same that dinner was a trial of patience and i was thankful when it was over in the old-fashioned way we left the men to their smoke and wandered through the drawing-room into a big domed palm-house which in its fragrant dimness with the giant palms reaching to the very roof looked much more inviting than the drawing-room with its glaring incandescent lights the american bride attached herself to me and chatted amusingly enough before her marriage she had lived out west so i plied her with questions about ranch life kathy writes regularly enough but she is a wretch about answering questions and is not half detailed enough to satisfy my curiosity we stood leaning against one of the tiered flower stands enjoying the scent and the beauty chatting together so lightly and calmly blankly unsuspicious as we so often are in the big moments of life of what lies immediately ahead 
between the spreading branches i caught sight of charmion looking at me with raised inquiring brows she had noted my eagerness and was wondering what point of interest had been discovered between the wordy american and myself i raised my voice and cried happily oh charmion mrs elliot knows kathy's home she has stayed there herself i am asking her all about it she smiled and moved forward as if to join us mrs elliot gave a little start and repeated curiously charmion is mrs fane called charmion that's a very unusual name i have only heard it once before very sweet isn't it but association goes for so much it does in this case it makes the name all the more charming why yes that is so mrs fane is a lovely woman but i guess i was less fortunate in my specimen i never met her myself but she married a man i knew well and ran away from him on their honeymoon i laughed i am so glad i laughed so glad there was time to say lightly she was soon tired before between the spreading leaves of a palm i caught charmion's eyes my charmion staring into mine and knew that she had overheard knew more knew in a blundering flash of intuition that the words which had just been spoken referred to no stranger but to herself fortunately for us both mrs elliot was facing me so she did not see as i did the sudden pause the blanching face the dumb appeal of the stricken eyes i flashed back reassurement and at once led the way forward out of the conservatory back to the drawing-room affecting to be tired to want to sit down mrs elliot followed unperturbed it didn't matter to her where she went the one indispensable necessity was to talk and to have some one to listen she continued her history with voluble emphasis i should think it was soon well i guess she might have thought it out before she went so far too hard on a man to be treated like that kind of humiliates him before his friends that a woman couldn't put up with him one month i shouldn't worry about his pride i said curtly what about hers it would be worse than humiliating for a woman to be obliged to go he must have been a poor thing well i don't know he was a real popular man he may have been a bit careless and extravagant quite a good many young men are that but they settle down into staid steady-going husbands if the right woman comes along to help doesn't seem to me miss swastness that it's possible for any man to be so bad that in three weeks the woman who had promised to stick to him till death should throw up the sponge it did not seem so to me either so i made no comment i should not have been human if i had not burned to ask questions but i would not allow myself to do it what charmion wished me to hear she would tell me herself the time had come when she would tell me i knew that this chance encounter had decided the moment when her silence should be broken mrs elliot smothered a yawn and straightened a diamond bracelet on her wrist the diamonds were massed together so heavily that the weight dragged them to the inside of her arm leaving only the plain gold band in sight a hiding of treasures which did not please the owner well she said deliberately once more i guess it was a real cruel trick whatever he'd done she put herself in the wrong that time the poor fellow's not done a mite of good ever since i had to hold myself tight to prevent a start not done she talked of the man in the present case as though he were alive as though stupefying thought charmion was not a widow after all the thought was stupefying but even as it passed through my brain i realized that no word of her own had been responsible for my conviction that her husband was dead it was rather because she never did mention him that kathy and i had made so sure that he did not exist my thoughts dived into the past recalling faded impressions i remembered how kathy had said she must have loved him dreadfully not to be able to refer to him even now and how i had been silent fighting the impression that it was the ghost of sorrow rather than of joy which sealed charmion's lips 
the door opened and the men came into the room the different groups broke up and drifted here and there into the palm house to look at the flowers back into the drawing-room to talk drink coffee and glance surreptitiously at the clock in this old-fashioned household no one thought of providing any other amusement for a dinner-party than the dinner itself having been well fed the guests were expected to amuse themselves for the hour that remained in an ordinary way i could have taken my share in the amusing i like talking and am never troubled by not knowing what to say given people to listen and look appreciative i can monologue for an indefinite time but to-night inside the palm house i could see charmion's grey figure reclining in a wicker chair her face ivory white against the cushions she was waving her fan to and fro and listening with apparent attention to the conversation of her companions i guessed how little she would hear how bitter must be the dread at her heart how endlessly interminably long the moments must seem miss wastneys would you care to see the picture we were talking about at dinner it was mr maplestone's voice i looked up and saw him standing by my side and rose at once thankful for any movement which would pass the time we left the room together walked to the end of the long corridor and drew up before the picture of an uninteresting old man with several chins and the small steel-blue eyes which seem a family inheritance this was a celebrated romney which had been the subject of a protracted lawsuit between different branches of the family which had cost the losing party over a thousand pounds i thought but did not say that i would have been obliged to any one who would have taken him away free gratis for nothing rather than that he should hang on my walls spoken comment under the circumstances was a little difficult and halting this is the romney oh yes my grandfather i see yes how interesting he laughed a short derisive bark <laughs> that's the last thing you can call it a more uninteresting production i never beheld what right had he to waste good canvas that is one point in which we do show more common sense than our ancestors we do not consider it necessary to inflict our portraits on posterity no we don't at least he swung round facing me with his back to the open drawing-room door his face suddenly keen and alert miss wastneys never mind the picture i brought you out as an excuse i wanted to ask what's the matter the question rapped out short and sharp i looked at him made a big effort to be bright and natural and defiant and realized suddenly that i was trembling that while my cheeks were hot my hands were cold as ice that in short the shock and excitement of the last half hour was taking its physical revenge for two straws i could have burst out crying there and then it is a ridiculous feminine weakness to be given to tears at critical moments but if you have it you have it and so far i have not discovered a cure i could have kept going if he had taken no notice and gone on talking naturally but that question knocked me over so i just stared at him and gulped and pressed my hands together with that awful awful sensation which comes over one when one knows it is madness to give way and yet feels that the moment after next you are just going to do it and nothing can stop you i thought of charmian sitting calm and quiet in the palm house i thought of that first horrible interview in the inn parlour i thought of my heroic ancestors it was no use every moment i drew nearer and nearer to the breaking point i still stared but the squire's face was growing misty growing into a big red-brown blur then suddenly a hand gripped my arm and a voice said sharply don't cry please no necessity to cry you are tired i will order the car it shall be round in five minutes you can surely pull yourself together for five minutes the voice was like a douche of cold water i shivered under it but felt wonderfully braced oh thank you but we ordered a fly that's all right i'll see to that no one shall know anything about it 
you will leave earlier than you expected that's all i'm sorry his lean face twitched the time has seemed so long it's not i said feebly it, it, it's not that but he led the way back to the drawing-room taking no notice five minutes later mrs fane's carriage was announced and we bade a protesting hostess good-night charmian and i sat silent hand in hand all the way home she felt cold as ice but she clung to me her fingers closed over mine just as we reached our own door she whispered a few words i'll come to your room dear wait up for me the time had come when i was to hear charmian's story from her own lips end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain more bitter than death charmian came to my room in her white dressing-gown with her long hair hanging plaited down her back remembering the icy hands i had held in mine i had lit the gas fire and she cowered gratefully over its warmth kind of you dear warmth is comforting well evelyn so the time has come i have waited screwing up my courage but the hour has been decided for us not unless you choose i cried hastily i would far rather never hear she checked me with a wan smile i do choose when it is over it will be a relief i want you to know you will understand better and i shall not pain you so much dear kind evelyn by my harsh ways so all this time you have believed that i was a happy widow the expression jarred she saw the shrinking in my eyes and smiled again in the same wan hopeless fashion oh i mean it death comes like a sword but in the end it is merciful for it brings peace the one who is left suffers many pangs but in time in time learns to be thankful for all that the beloved is spared it is the living troubles which sear the heart i have envied the widows who could look up and say it is well with him we shall meet again with me it has been all bitterness all rebellion i sat silent not daring to interrupt and after a moment's pause she began again speaking in a still level tone with hardly any variety of expression i am an orphan like you evelyn both my parents died before i was fourteen and i was sent over to america to live with a grandmother aunt i was an heiress unfortunately you know my views about riches and by my father's will i came into my money at eighteen my aunt was a wise woman and even to her intimate friends she never gave a hint of my fortune she was a wealthy woman herself and had no daughter only one son so it seemed natural that she should give me a good time dress me prettily and take me about she had a horror of fortune hunters and wanted me to be loved for myself and be as happily married as she had been before me when i came out she brought me over to london for a season and i was presented but that was my one and only visit to england in fifteen years i was glad to go back to new york for my real friends were there we had grown up together and had the associations of years in england i had only acquaintances well so it went on the happiest of lives till i was twenty-four several men wanted to marry me but i never met any one whom it was possible to think of as a husband until your husband yes we were away for the summer a whole party of us camping in the most delicious spot i wish you could join an american camping party some time evelyn it's just the happiest freest most ideal of lives he came down as the guest of some other people the daughter was one of my own friends i thought at first that she cared for him herself but he never paid her any attention not the slightest rather avoided her indeed even before 
he cared for you did it begin soon farmian i cared for him the first moment we met i was sitting at a long tea-table set out in the open and my friend brought him up to a seat right opposite to mine she said charmian this is phil phil this is charmian it was one of the rules of the camp that we called each other by our christian names the life was so informal that mr and miss seemed out of place i looked up and met his eyes and it was different from anything i had felt before he came for a week but he stayed on and on until it was nearly a month i can't talk about it evelyn such times can never last even at the best it is impossible that they can last perfect happiness is not for this world it was all beautiful the place where we camped was like another garden of eden the weather was exquisite such days such mornings oh evelyn such nights the sky a dome of deepest blue with the stars shining as you never saw them in this damp misty atmosphere and he and i her voice broke her hand went up to her face to hide the quivering of her lips it was petrifying thing to see charmian break down i turned away my eyes unable to bear it there was silence in the room for several moments then she began again nothing was said in words i didn't want him to speak i was perfectly happy perfectly sure and i dreaded the publicity of an engagement every one talking questioning teasing it would have seemed profanation besides if marjorie had really cared as i suspected it would have been painful for her i wouldn't let him speak until we got back to new york and then the very night i arrived aunt mary was taken dangerously ill she lingered a few weeks but there was never any hope then she died and i was left alone for her son my cousin lived in india all that time he my husband had been coming to see me every day the doctor insisted that i should go out to be braced by the fresh air so he took me long drives long walks and then sat by me indoors comforting me helping advising he was everything to me evelyn aunt mary was dying and she had been like a mother but when he was with me i was satisfied i was content when she died he urged an immediate marriage and i was quite ready she had left no money to me but i i told him i had some of my own he kissed me and again her hand went up to hide that quivering lip he said that did not concern him he could keep his wife what money i had i must keep for myself to pay for little extravagancies i was thankful that he did not know thankful that he did not care i looked forward to telling him after we were married and seeing his face of surprise we had planned to live in an apartment till we had time to choose a house for ourselves i laughed to think how much bigger and finer it would be than the little house of his dreams he was not at all rich did i tell you that he had had a pretty hard struggle all his life and had only quite a moderate income i went to my lawyer and settled a fourth of my income on him for life i knew if we lived in a bigger way there would be calls upon him which he would not otherwise have had calls for subscriptions for charities a dozen other claims i hated to think that he should have to come to me for money or that cheques should be drawn in my name he asked me what i was going to give him as a wedding present and i laughed and said hm, nothing interesting only a little note the settlement was to be my gift silence again i felt for her hand and held it tight tragedy was coming i knew it i waited tense with suspense we were married very quietly only two or three people in the church he called for me it was unconventional but i was nervous and weak and he knew he could give me strength we went up the aisle together hand in hand the man who was to give me away followed behind many people in america are married in their own homes but i prefer to church i've been sorry since it has seemed a profanation to stand before the altar in god's house and take those solemn vows while all the time all the time 
she shuddered and paused to regain self-possession well evelyn well i had two weeks happiness two weeks in my fool's paradise and then the end came he had gone over to new york for a day some important business had arisen and he was obliged to go he said good-bye she paused again struggling for composure it was good-bye good-bye forever he did not know that but he parted from me as a husband might part from the wife of his heart it was impossible to doubt i was as sure of him evelyn as sure as that the sun is in the sky after he had gone a letter was handed to me i did not know the writing but inside i could not understand it it was a letter in his own writing nothing else just this one sheet with one long passage underscored i did not stop to think the words leapt at me my own name first of all and after i had begun to read there was no stopping short it was the second sheet of a letter so i could not tell to whom it had been written but evidently it was to a man to whom money was owing and who had been pressing for a settlement it was full of apologies for having failed to pay before and then then came the passage that had been underlined perhaps he said in a few months time things would look up there was a girl in a roundabout way through an english acquaintance he had heard that she had a pile of money though the fact had been kept dark in america there was no doubt about it since his informant was a member of the legal firm who had wound up her father's estate by a stroke of good luck the girl was staying at a summer camp with some of his own friends he had engineered an invitation and was there at the moment of writing think of it evelyn at that very moment i was perhaps sitting innocently by his side we used to scribble our letters together sitting out in the woods and break off every few minutes to laugh and chatter probably after it was finished we walked together to the nearest post and as we went he looked at me he looked oh she winced in irrepressible misery is it possible is it possible that any man could act so well can you wonder that i am hard and cold that i have so little sympathy for outside troubles i was once as loving and impetuous as you are yourself but that shock turned me to stone it killed my faith in human nature she was silent struggling for composure and i laid my hand on her knee and sat silent not daring to speak what was there to say i realized now how infinitely more bitter than death was the loss which charmian had to bear well she roused herself to go on with her story you can imagine the rest the heiress was he wrote quite a possible girl and seemed agreeably disposed there was evidently no previous entanglement and the circumstances were propitious it was his intention to go in and win if it came off he would be in a position to pay up old scores and to start life afresh it would be worth giving up his liberty to end the everlasting worry of the last ten years the letter ended with more promises and his signature no loophole of doubt was left you see there could be no mistaking that signature i had been married exactly two weeks and had believed myself the happiest woman in the world i now discovered that i had been tracked down by an adventurer who had married me only because unfortunately it was impossible to get hold of my fortune without putting up with me at the same time what did he say how did he look when you told him about your money in the settlement of course you had told him by that time not much very little indeed i thought at the time that he was overwhelmed and a little sorry that the wealth was on my side looking back i do him the justice to believe that he was ashamed even such a deliberate schemer might well feel a pang under the circumstances i remember that he put his elbows on the table and hid his face in his hands he never alluded to the subject again and neither did i there seemed plenty of time 
i loved him all the more because he was not wildly elated all my life i had been trained to dread fortune hunters to value sincerity above every other virtue but during those two weeks after you were married he still seemed to care you believed in him still absolutely utterly i must be easily duped evelyn for with all my heart i believed that that man loved me as deeply as i loved him every word every look oh he was a finished actor it all seemed so real so real charmian after you had read that letter and understood all that it meant what did you do i went to my room packed a bag with a few changes of clothing collected all the money i had with me quite a large sum in notes and caught the afternoon train for new york i had no idea where i was going my one longing was to escape before he came back but things were decided for me the shock made me faint and in the heat of the train i felt worse every hour when we stopped at a halfway station i stepped out onto the platform in the same dull dazed way hardly realizing what i was doing and carried my bag out into the street half a mile away i saw a notice of rooms to let in the window of a small house and i knocked and went in i stayed in that house for over six months evelyn the woman was a saint the kindliest gentlest creature i have ever met i told her that i was ill and in trouble and wanted to rest and she put me to bed and nursed me like a child i was a long time in getting well the very strings of my being seemed to have snapped i lay torpid week after week and the good soul took care of me and asked no questions she was one of those rare spirits who pray to god to guide them day by day and mean literally what they ask god had sent me to her in my need that was her firm belief and what she did for me she did for him i had left no message behind only that terrible letter sealed up to be given to my husband on his return i heard afterwards that he had searched for me far and wide had even crossed over to england thinking i must be here when i was well enough i sent for my aunt's lawyer and took him into my confidence he let me know when my husband returned to america and as soon as possible after that i came to england myself under another name i was no longer his wife in heart why should i keep a name which was given to me under false pretenses five years have passed since then it seems like a century and here i am and all this time you've heard nothing nothing has happened yes i have heard he seems to have felt it a good deal it is always painful to be discovered and for a man's wife to leave him before the honeymoon is over is hurtful to his pride he makes periodic efforts to find me but my lawyers are loyal and will give no clue and the settlement the money you made over to him does he draw that still she flushed and frowned no it appears not he tells the lawyers that he will never touch it i suppose if he changed his manner of living it would be remarked and people might guess something of the truth his object is of course to throw all the blame on me the bitterness of her voice hurt me so that i ventured a timid protest charmian i am not taking his part i think he was contemptible beyond words but isn't it possible that he has regretted that he has not taken the money because he was ashamed possible of course but i should say extremely improbable however i am no longer concerned in his motives he gave up his liberty for a certain price and the price is his the money accumulates at the bank some day no doubt he will find it convenient to draw it i felt a movement of revolt and cried quickly there is one person i despise even more than the man himself and that is the creature who kept that letter and sent it to you too late to prevent the marriage if it were to be done at all why could it not have been done before her lips curved yes it was very cruel that was another disillusion evelyn i have always been convinced that marjorie was the sender 
probably the letter had been written to her brother or to some near relation and in some way had come into her possession she behaved very strangely about our engagement but i had been her friend how could she find it in her heart if there had been any possibility of doubt i would have gone straight to her and demanded the truth but what was the use the letter was there i should only have brought more suffering upon myself she wanted him for herself and could not forgive me for taking him away but if she had come to me at the beginning when she saw how things might go i should have gone away myself and left the coast clear even if it hurt myself i should have been loyal to another woman who had cared first even now i have done my best for her i offered through my lawyers to make no objection if he chose to free himself legally it could be done in america you know i explained that it would make no difference to the settlement that was made and should remain unchanged i looked at her sharply for the sneer in her voice hurt me more than the pain charmian forgive me dearest you have been cruelly treated but don't be vexed aren't you in the wrong too in feeling so bitter after all these years to my surprise she assented instantly oh yes very wrong more wrong than they perhaps for i have had so long to think and what they did was done on an impulse don't think i excuse myself evelyn i don't i see quite well how hard and bitter i am but you can't forgive she hesitated her grey eyes gazing into space what exactly is forgiveness if by lifting a little finger i could make him suffer as he has made me nothing would induce me to do it if by lifting a little finger i could bring him happiness and success i think no i am sure that i would not hesitate but to purge my heart of bitterness that is beyond me it's always there deep down a hard hard wall hiding the light shutting me out from man and from god the last words came in a whisper i knew the effort with which they were spoken and sat silent clinging to her hand what what could i say i with my easy sunshiny life how dared i dictate to her great grief and yet i knew i knew only in one way could peace come back the remembrance of the vicar's first sermon came back to my heart like a breath of fresh air forgetting the things that are behind i said softly couldn't you try that charmian forgetting and pressing forward if forgiving seems beyond you for the moment couldn't you take the first step for the first time since she entered the room her face lightened into something like her own natural smile ah evelyn that's like you thank you dear for the reminder that was the text on our first sunday here there is one thing i would like you to know you have helped me more than anything else you attracted me because you possess to excess the very qualities which i have lost trust faith overflowing kindliness and love it has been a tonic to be with you there have been times working in the garden by your side seeing all the live green things springing out of darkness when i've been happy again better than happy at peace but now this upheaval it has renewed it all evelyn do you think she suspected do you think she'll talk i'm sure she won't absolutely sure she had not a flickering doubt the name is different you see and she's too much absorbed in herself and her own affairs to waste any thought upon us in a few days they sail for india yes she drew a sigh of relief that's good i'm thankful it would have been so hard to be uprooted again but you can understand evelyn that for a time she rose stretched herself to her full height and threw out her arms restlessly the roving fit is on me i must be off into the wilds and fight it out by myself i had known it was coming subconsciously had known it for weeks but it was hard all the same we had been so happy and in six short months my roots seemed to have gone down surprisingly deep i hated the idea of leaving past times but i reminded myself that it was only for a time 
only for a time of course charmian assured me heartily it is august now we will make a rendezvous for christmas perhaps i may turn up before that like a bad penny but you may depend on me for christmas you you will go to your flat evelyn i nodded silently the pixie scheme had for the moment lost its charm but i would not give in silly one murmured charmian fondly you dear goose well good luck to you may you make other people as happy as you have made me end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain a young wife's dilemma not another word about herself did charmion say but she began at once to make preparations for going abroad and before a week is over she will be off she has friends in italy it appears and will probably spend some time near them but even i am only to have an official address from which letters are to be forwarded she warns me that i may hear very seldom since when a dark mood is on the very essence of a cure seems to be to hide herself in utter solitude well i also am going to hide and to shelter myself behind an official address so i ought not to complain but all the same i do feel lorn and lone first kathy torn away to another continent and now charmion who is so wonderfully dear the next thing will be that bridget will announce some fine morning that she is going to marry the gardener i told her so in a moment of dejection and she petrified me by replying calmly indeed and he's been after pestering me to do it since the moment we set foot there's a deal worse things i might do bridget i gasped and i lay back in my chair i had spoken in the most absolute unbelief there were no illusions between bridget and me each knew the other's age to an hour and queen anne herself had not seemed to me more dead to romance than my staid maid i stared at her broad worn face her broad elderly figure in a petrified surprise bridget do you really mean do you honestly mean that you like him too she simpered like any bit of a girl and why wouldn't i be liking him miss evelyn isn't he the fine figure of a man and as pleasant a way with him as if he'd been irish himself but bridget you're forty-five do women can women is it possible to care at forty-five bridget chuckled not a bit offended but simply amused and superior <laughs> what's forty-five but the prime of life care are you asking deed it's not forty-five that's going to see a heart frozen stiff ye mind me of the old dame of eighty who was asked what was the age when a woman stopped caring about a man deed says she i can't tell you that you'll have to be asking someone older than me <laughs> she laughed again and i took my turn at looking superior then of course under the circumstances you will not be inclined to come with me to town deed and i will then i'd rather be with you than any man that walks and besides added bridget shrewdly won't he be all the keener for doing without me a bit i jumped up and marched out of the room feeling jarred and irritated and utterly out of sympathy that's the worst of being a spinster you can never count on your companions as a continuance kathy left me at the invitation of a man she had known a few months charmion regards me as a narcotic to distract her thoughts from another man and flies off the moment his memory becomes troublesome and now even bridget men are a nuisance they upset everything i've come to the vicarage when delphine heard of our departure from pastimes she developed a sudden and violent desire to have me for a visitor for a short time before i left she's nervy and depressed 
tired out after her hard work the dear vicar translates it and has got it into her head that my society is the one and only thing that can set her right it is flattering and convenient into the bargain for we are lending pastime to the widow of a poor clergyman and it will be a help to her to have me at hand until she has settled down it seemed a waste of good things to leave the house empty through all the lovely autumn months this poor soul is delighted to come we are delighted to have her the cook and the housemaid are resigned to the change of mistress more one cannot expect i've been here a week and am already endorsing the theory that you can never really know a person until you have lived together beneath the same roof before i came i thought the vicar as nearly perfect a husband as a man could be and delphine about as unsatisfactory a wife now after studying them for one short week i have modified both opinions she is a lovable warm-hearted well-meaning weak vain dissatisfied child he is a very fine a very noble a very blind and irritatingly inconsiderate man on wednesday he ordered dinner an hour earlier for his own convenience and he never came home at all on friday he said he would be out all day and walked in at one o'clock bringing three visitors in his train demanding a hot lunch he also it appears is difficult about money which is not in any sense meant to imply that he is mean but simply that he wishes to give away as much as possible to other people and to deny his own household in order to be able to do it i was in the room one day when delphine presented the monthly bills and his face was a network of worry and depression the grocer's book was not included he asked for it and said it had been missing some time delphine prevaricated i knew as well as if i'd been told that she was afraid to show it after he had gone out her mood changed she lifted the little red books from the table flung them one after another to the ceiling caught them with an agile hand and sent them spinning into the corner of the room this done she danced around the table came to a standstill in front of my chair and defiantly snapped her fingers i don't care i don't care a snap i've done my best and now i shan't worry any more it isn't as if it were necessary he could allow me more if he chose why should a man stint his wife to give the money away to outsiders charity begins at home he expects me to manage on a pittance yet there must always be plenty of everything soup to send at a moment's notice to any one who is ill puddings jellies and all the stupid old bores coming to meals could you keep house for this household on i was startled at the smallness of the sum she mentioned horrified when i contrasted it with our own bills at pastimes my dear no my opinion of you has gone up by leaps and bounds if you can keep anywhere near that you manage wonderfully i had no idea you were so clever oh well she said uncomfortably oh well perhaps not so clever as you think one gets tired of struggling after the impossible in for a penny in for a pound life is too short to worry oneself over happenies i shall tell the men to send in the books quarterly after this i'm tired of being hectored every month better get it over in one big dose i thought of the vicar's pensive darling isn't this very high and laughed at the idea of hectoring but the quarterly bills seemed a dangerous remedy won't your husband object men hate bills to run on oh she waved a complacent hand i'll put him off he'll remember every now and then and then it will float out of his mind it's always an effort to jacky to come down to mundane things evelyn be warned by me and never never marry an unworldly man it's impossible to live with them with any peace or comfort well if i do i'll see to it that he is worldly enough to understand household bills i'll keep house for a month within his own limits and let him see how he likes the fare delphine stared 
jacky wouldn't mind so long as there was enough to give away he'd eat cold meat and mashed potatoes and contentment with all every day of the week and never complain i should punish myself not him evelyn she subsided on the floor at my feet laid her hands on my knee and lifted her flushed childish face to mine such a delicate rose-leaf of a face more like a child's than that of a grown-up woman now that you've stayed here and seen for yourself what it's like truthfully aren't you just a little sorry for me week after week month after month always the same routine of meeting and parish work and keeping house it is jacky's work his vocation but for me a girl of twenty-two do you think it is quite fair i don't think you ought to ask me such questions i would rather not interfere i said feebly i knew it was feeble but it is a very very delicate business to interfere between husband and wife and moreover the blame seemed fairly evenly divided the vicar had undoubtedly made a mistake in marrying a young girl for her beauty and charm without considering if she were a true helpmeet for his life's work delphine had undoubtedly made a mistake in never thinking of her future as a clergyman's wife and now he was blindly expecting a miraculous transformation of the butterfly into a drone while the butterfly was poising her wings impatient for flight i sat silent and delphine said pettishly oh, i don't ask you to interfere only to sympathize is this a life for a girl of my age well it depends entirely upon the girl and her ideas of life some girls would what love what you call perish find it in her greatest interest she stared at me the colour slowly mounting to her face her voice dropped to a whisper yes i know if i were good and really cared evelyn i am going to confess something dreadful at home when i had no responsibility i cared far more than i do now i thought it would be the other way about but the feeling that i must do things must go to meetings and committees must go to church for all the services makes me feel that i'd rather not i daren't say so to jacky he'd be so grieved i'm grieved myself i daren't tell any one but you do you think any clergyman's wife felt the same before <laughs> i laughed i'm sure of it thousands of them it's not right to expect a clergyman's wife to be an unpaid curate plus a housekeeper and it needs special grace to stand a succession of committees how would it be to drop some of the most boring duties and concentrate upon the things that you could do with all your heart you'd be happier and would do more good do you think i should she clutched eagerly at the suggestion really i believe you are right as you say i have not the strength to play the part of an unpaid curate but that misquotation roused me and i contradicted her sharply excuse me i said nothing of the sort you are strong enough to do anything you choose it is not strength that is wanting but go on you might as well finish now you've begun but what love <gasps> she gave a little gasp of astonishment love for whom your neighbours your husband god oh if you were going to preach next she cried impatiently she jumped up from her seat whirled round and flounced from the room mr maplestone came in to tea he's quite a frequent visitor here i find besides the fact that he is a vicar's churchwarden 
it appears that he has known delphine since she was a child so that he is absolutely at home with her and evidently very fond of her too in a cousinly elder brotherly absolutely matter-of-fact way the first time i saw him was quite early one morning when hearing unusual sounds of merriment from the dining-room i opened the door and beheld the vicar seated in an armchair looking on with much amusement while the squire held a box of chocolates in one upraised hand and delphine capered round him snatching and leaping into the air like an excited little dog it was a festive little scene until my head came peeping round the corner of the door and then the fun collapsed like the pricking of a bubble the squire's face fell likewise his hand he jerked stiffly to attention stiffly handed over the chocolates stiffly bowed to me stared at my uncovered head oh i didn't tell you evelyn is staying here for a fortnight before going away he mumbled i mumbled the vicar rose from his seat and made for the door well we shall see you to lunch to-morrow ralph i have several points to discuss delphine we shall meet at the parish room at twelve oh that committee i suppose so delphine said ungraciously she tore open her box helped herself to the largest chocolate in the centre row and offered me the next choice ralph maplestone took up his hat oh for goodness sake don't you run away too you haven't a committee there are heaps of things i want to say still ralph she went to his side and stared eagerly in his face did you mean what you said the other day about teaching me to ride why not he said easily if you care about it i'd be only too glad bess would carry you well and she's as safe as a house you could come up and practice in the park if i were busy jevons could take you round he'd teach you quite as well or better than i should myself oh she beamed at him a picture of happiness it will be fine i've always longed to ride and afterwards when i'm quite good i feel it in my bones that i shall be good will you still <laughs> he laughed good-naturedly he is extraordinarily good-natured to delphine lend you best certainly as often as you like do her good to have the exercise and when i'm very good very good indeed will you he shook his head oh hunting is a different matter rather a responsibility what we must see what john says in the meantime you'll get a habit yes she glanced at me quickly and glanced away where shall i go would matthews matthews was the local tailor the squire waved aside the suggestion with masculine scorn certainly not do the thing properly when you are about it nothing worse than a badly cut habit better go up to town again delphine glanced at me the obvious thing was for me to return her invitation and invite her to stay with me for the transaction but obviously i couldn't do it moreover i did not want to so i stared blankly before me and resigned myself to being thought a mean thing oh well i'll manage somehow delphine said in a tone of finality which was obviously intended to stop the discussion mr maplestone looked at me and said mrs fane has already left i believe i suppose you will join her later i think not she has gone abroad i shall remain in england delphine gave a short irritable laugh i had annoyed her and childlike she wished to hit back <laughs> abroad in england that's all the address we are vouchsafed mrs fane and miss wastneys evidently wish to shake off the dust of this village as soon as they drive away from pastimes even if we wish to communicate with them we shall not be able to do it oh yes delphine you will i contradicted i've told you that letters will always reach us through our lawyers lawyers she repeated eloquently 
as if one could send ordinary letters in a roundabout way like that i wouldn't dare to write through a lawyer unless it were a matter of life and death i must say evelyn you are queer when we have got to know each other so well too you thought it queer that charmion and i should live together and now you think it queer when we go away isn't that a little unreasonable it is queer to be so mysterious about where you are going people ordinarily very well then we are not ordinary let us leave it at that it is much more interesting to be mysterious perhaps we are really two authors of world-wide fame who put ourselves in the country for a short rest now and then between our dazzling spells of industry delphine gaped hesitated then laughed complacently oh well mrs fane is the sort of person who might be anything but not you evelyn certainly not you you are not what clever enough she cried bluntly the next minute with one of the swift childlike impulses which made her so lovable she threw her arms round my neck and kissed me vehemently but you are good good and kind that's better than all the cleverness forgive me evelyn i'm a rude bad-tempered thing kiss and be friends ralph maplestone seized his hat and marched out of the room End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain a startling proposal of marriage this afternoon the squire in his capacity of churchwarden spent an hour with the vicar in his study and then joined us for tea on the lawn it was a hot airless summer afternoon and we were all rather silent and disinclined to eat and i felt my eyes wandering to the big grey car which stood waiting outside the gate and wishing many things i wished that i had a car of my own i wished i had my dear old dinah on whose back i had been wont to roam the countryside so long as charmion in the garden had absorbed my attention i had been contented enough but now an overwhelming restlessness seized me i was tired of the slow movement of my own feet i longed to move quickly to feel the refreshing rush of air on my cheeks once more i wished the woman-hating unappreciative ralph maplestone had been a kind considerate understanding put yourself in her place sort of man who would have offered his time and his car and his services as chauffeur delphine would you like to have a run in the car for a couple of hours or so before dinner we jumped on our chairs delphine and i automatically like marionettes the one from pleasure the other from surprise had he seen had he noticed the light blue eyes stared coolly ahead for pure callous indifference their expression could not have been beaten coincidence nothing more oh ralph you dear how angelic of you i should love it of all things it's so close and stuffy in this garden it will be perfectly delicious to have a blow which way shall we go if you are not in a hurry we might get as far as the ponds he paused frowned glanced hesitatingly towards me perhaps miss wastneys is there any special place you would like to see dearest the vicar's voice broke gently into the conversation i'm sorry but was it not this afternoon you arranged to meet mrs rawlins at the hall to discuss the new coverings for the library books i think you said half past five it is nearly five now you would not have time i can send down word that i can't come i'll meet her to-morrow at the same time i think not the vicar's face set his voice did not lose its gentle tone but it was full of decision i think not 
mrs rawlins is a busy woman and she has a long distance to come you would not wish to inconvenience her for the sake of a trifling pleasure delphine gave him a look the look of a thwarted child flushed to the roots of her hair and turned hastily aside open rebellion was useless but it spoke in every line of her body every movement of the small graceful head i was sorry for her for being young and feminine myself i could understand how dull was the claim of linen covers for injured bindings compared with that swift exhilarating rush i looked at the vicar and began pleadingly couldn't i then the squire looked at me pulled out his watch and said sharply ten minutes to five hurry up delphine if you put on your hat at once you can have half an hour it will freshen you up for your duties i'll land you at the hall and he switched his eyes on me with a keen gimlet-like glance take miss wastney's a little further while you are engaged i blinked but did not speak delphine frowned the vicar said happily that will do well that will do very well now darling we shall all be pleased deluded man two less pleased looking females it would have been difficult to find as we made our way to the house and up the narrow twisting staircase delphine was injured at the prospective shortness of her drive i was appalled at the length of mine why had he asked me why hadn't i refused and what oh what should we ever find to say it's always the same thing if a bit of pleasure comes along there's bound to be a committee meeting in the way half an hour pleased indeed i've always been longing for ralph to take me on drives and now that he has been disappointed like this the very first time is he likely to try again of course evelyn tardy sense of hospitality i am glad for you to have the change it's awfully good of him quite heroic isn't it i said tartly as i turned into my room no doubt the poor man was disappointed but she need not have rubbed it in i leave it to psychologists to decide whether or not there was any connection between my natural annoyance at the slight and the fact that i went to the trouble of opening a special box in order to put on my best and newest motor bonnet and coat but there it is i did do it and they were all the more becoming for the accompaniment of flushed cheeks and extra bright eyes the colour was a soft dove grey the bonnet a delicious concoction of drawn silk which looked as if it had begun life meaning to adorn a quaker's head and had then suddenly succumbed to the fascinations of a pink lining and a wreath of tiny pink roses when delphine came into the room a moment later she stopped short on the threshold and gasped with astonishment goodness her face flushed she stared with bright wide eyes admiring critical disapproving all at once evelyn what a get-up i never saw anything like it you look you look well how do i look there was an edge in my voice she felt it and softened at once in her quick lovable fashion you look a duck simply a duck but my dear it's too good why waste it here any old thing will do for these lanes there's time to change i don't intend to change i said obstinately and at that very moment there sounded an imperious whistle from below without another word we marched downstairs and out to the front gate where the two men stood waiting beside the car automatically their eyes rolled toward my bonnet the vicar smiled and bent his head in a courtly little bow which said much without the banality of words the squire had no expression whether he approved or disapproved or furiously disliked he remained insoluble as the sphinx oh some day somehow someone i hope will wake him into life and whoever she is may she shake him well up and ride roughshod over him for a long long time before she gives in he needs taking down 
after a faint very faint protest delphine took her seat in front while i sat in solitary state inside leaning back against the cushions with an outward appearance of ease but inwardly uncomfortably conscious of a heart which beat more quickly than necessary this was all very well but what next what was to happen when the half-hour was up and delphine went off to her library books and left us alone could i sit still where i was it would seem absurd not to say discourteous would he ask me to change seats would he expect me to suggest it suppose he did suppose he didn't and when we were settled what should i find to say my mind mentally rehearsed possible openings how beautiful the country is looking english villages are so charming how was the general when you saw him last on and on like a whirligig went the silly futile thoughts while before me the two heads wagged and nodded and tossed and a laughing conversation was kept up with apparently equal enjoyment on both sides delphine had a child's capacity for enjoying the present even when the car pulled up and she alighted before the door of the parish hall the smile was still on her face the little treat had blown away the cobwebs she was refreshed and ready if not precisely anxious for work thanks awfully ralph that was as good as a hundred tonics i do think a car is a glorious possession then she looked at me and nodded encouragingly now it is your turn it's ever so much more fun in front ralph will be quite proud of sitting beside your bonnet so after all neither of us said it and i should never have the satisfaction of knowing if he had meant he opened the door and i meekly got out and took the other seat what was the use of making a fuss delphine disappeared behind the oak door the engines whirled and we were off again steaming out of the village and down the sloping road which led to the lovely sweep of the heath the speed steadily increasing until we were travelling at a good forty miles an hour four milestones flashed past before either of us spoke a word and then in desperation i made a beginning she needs change doesn't she it's quite touching to see how it cheers her up she he repeated who he turned his eyes on me as he spoke and they were absolutely genuinely blank astounding as it appeared he really did not know delphine of course who else could i mean oh 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 yes i had forgotten all about her he might have been talking of a fly that for a moment had buzzed by his side the cruel indifference of his manner stung me into quick retort yet you seemed very kind you were very kind to her a few minutes ago do you always forget so quickly a movement of his hand reduced the speed of the engine we had left the village far behind and the wide road stretched before us like a brown ribbon sloping gently up and down the grassy slopes for miles ahead there was not a soul in view ralph maplestone stared at me and i stared back at him seen close at hand his plain face had an attraction of its own it looked strong and honest its tints were all fresh and clean speaking of a healthy out-of-door life no little child had ever clearer eyes they didn't look so stern as i had believed what have i to remember delphine came for a drive i'm glad she enjoyed it but it is over why should i think of her any more oh no reason at all i said testily i felt testy as if from a personal injury only when one has a friend it is agreeable to believe that out of sight is not immediately out of mind but of course i am a woman women's memories are proverbially longer than men's the speed slackened still further now we were rumbling along at a speed which made conversation easy the blue eyes gave me another keen glance 
women burden their memories with a thousand trivialities men brush them aside and keep to the few that count in the big things of life they are less forgetful than women i smiled a slow superior smile and spoke in a forbearing voice do you think you really understand very much about women no i don't how can i i don't know any he replied bluntly and the answer was so surprisingly illogically different from what i expected that involuntarily i laughed and went on laughing while he stammered and tried to explain of course i have my opinion every fellow has one has eyes one can't go through life without seeing but personally it's quite true i don't know any never have done your mother you would think so but we are too much alike tongue-tied can't say what we feel she is more at home with my sister who chatters from morning till night and has no reticences no susceptibilities we care for each other to a point we are good friends but beyond that strangers i didn't laugh any more your sister then don't you too no she was educated abroad she married the year she came out she lives in scotland nominally we are brother and sister actually the merest acquaintances she is a nice girl generous affectionate but we don't touch delphine that child his shoulders moved with a gesture of dismissal as if the suggestion was too absurd for discussion poor delphine how her vanity would have suffered if she had been there at the moment i suppose my face was expressive for he added in quick explanation she's a nice child i'm fond of her but she is still waiting to grow up it's perfectly true miss wastes i know no women they have been a sealed book to me i was sorry for the big lonely thing it must be hard to be born with a temperament which keeps one closed as it were within iron doors while all the time the poor hungry soul longs to get out i felt glad that i was made the other way round at the same time it seemed a good opportunity to put in a word for my own sex i straightened my back and tried to look solemn and elderly i spoke in deep impressive tones mr maplestone i'm sorry but you are illogical you acknowledge that this is a subject about which you know nothing yet almost in the same breath you criticise and condemn men blame women for having no sense of justice but they are just as bad they are worse and with less excuse women's perceptions are so keen that they see every side of a situation so it happens sometimes that they get confused and appear contradictory men are so blind that they only see one side their own side and in utter ignorance of all the others they proceed to lay down the law for my part i prefer the woman's standpoint such a blankly amazed face stared into mine the blue eyes widened a glimpse of strong white teeth showed between the parted lips he gaped like a child and said vaguely yes but i don't understand that may all be quite true but what on earth has it got to do with what we were talking of last i bridled nothing on earth is more exasperating than to enlarge on one's own pet theories and then to find that they have fallen flat i made my voice as chilling as possible to me the connection seems obvious sorry my stupidity i suppose i fail to grasp it will you explain you said that delphine was not a woman if that is so it's her husband's fault and yours and every other man's with whom she comes in contact you all treat her like a child and expect her to behave as a child and then turn round and abuse her because she dances to your tune excuse me who abuses her you did you said i said she was a charming child of whom i was very fond is that abuse 
in the uh, the connection in which you used it in the way in which you said it and meant it and avoided saying something else yes it is for a moment he looked as if he were going to laugh then met my eyes thought better of it and grunted instead hmm. sorry again i don't quite follow but no doubt it is my illogical mind i should be interested to know in what way you hold me responsible for delphine's shortcomings i have just told you you treat her as a child who must be fed on sweetmeats and bribed with treats and diversions conversationally you talk down to her level it never occurs to you to expect her to be in earnest about any one thing well well isn't that enough can't you see how such an attitude must affect her character and development no i can't to my mind it wouldn't matter what the whole world thought for good or ill i stand for myself what other people happen to think about me wouldn't affect me one jot i said loftily you are a man women are different we do care we are affected that's why it is so dreadfully important that we should be understood i know it by experience in different surroundings with different people i myself am two or three totally different women he asked no questions but looked at me silent expectant and lured by that fatal love of talking about oneself which exists in so many feminine hearts i fell into the trap and prattled thoughtlessly on at home with my younger sister i was the one who had all the responsibility and management she depended on me i was the autocrat of the household and everything i said was law you would like that i gave him a withering glance pray what makes you think so you like your own way don't you i am um, have received that impression i was about to add i said coldly that since i have lived at pastimes i have not had my own way at all i have not wanted it mrs fane's character is stronger than mine i have been content to abdicate in her favour if you asked her opinion of me she would probably tell you that i was too pliable too easily influenced silence the blunt roughly hewn profile stared stolidly ahead a granite wall would have shown as much expression i was seized with an immense a devastating curiosity to discover what he was thinking i fixed my eyes steadily upon him mentally willing him to turn round he knew i was doing it i could see the red rise above his collar rim and mount steadily to his ears he was determined that he would not speak i was equally determined that he should mr maplestone i'm waiting for a remark miss wasnes i uh, i have no remark to make you don't recognize me in the latter role i i can't say that i do on the few occasions on which we have met you have appeared to me to be abundantly to be in short the ruling spirit i thought of that first interview in the inn when the brunt of the bargaining had fallen on me i thought of the tragic evening at the hall when i had arranged a hurried departure without apparently consulting charmian's wishes appearances were against me and it was impossible to explain them away i said in a cross hurt voice oh of course you think me everything that is disagreeable and domineering it is just as i said men see only one thing and it colours their whole view if i lived a lifetime of meekness and self-abnegation you would never forget that affair of the lease and it was your own fault too you were the unreasonable one not i but all the same you have never forgotten delphine told me how much you disliked me his eyes met mine frankly without a flicker of shame did she that was wrong of her she had no business to repeat 
you acknowledge it then you did say so i did oh yes it's quite true it was a shock at that moment i realized that in my vanity i had never really believed delphine's statement the squire had made some casual remark which she had misunderstood misquoted such had been the subconscious explanation with which i had assuaged my complacency but now out of his own lips openly unhesitatingly the verdict was confirmed i felt as if a pail of water had been emptied over my head and you 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 really meant if i had not meant it i should hardly have said i can't think why what had i done if it was that affair of the lease it was not i was amazed at the time but i got over that it was just what it is difficult to say it's not an easy subject to discuss need we go on i think so i think it is my right in justice to myself i think you ought to tell me how i have made myself so disagreeable it might be useful to me in the future for an answer he steered the car to the side of the road brought it to a standstill and descended from his seat there was an air of deliberation about the proceeding which sent a shiver down my spine the inference was that the enumeration of my faults was so lengthy a business that it could not be undertaken by a man who had other work in hand i sat in nervous fascination watching him slowly cross to my side of the car lean forward and place both hands on the screen his face was quite close to mine it looked suddenly white and tense he opened his lips and spoke evelyn will you be my wife if i live to be a hundred never no never shall i forget the electric shock of that moment to be prepared to listen to a lecture on one's faults and failings and to hear in its place a proposal of marriage could anything be more paralyzing and to have it hurled at one with no warning no preliminary leading up and from ralph maplestone of all people the most reserved the most unsusceptible the most woman-hating of mankind i sat petrified unable to move or to speak unable to do anything but stare and stare and stare and listen with incredulous ears to a string of passionate protestations half of what he said was lost in the dazed bewilderment of the moment but what i did hear went something like this you are the first woman the only woman before you came i was content since we met i have been in torment you woke me up when a man is roused from a trance it gives him pain you brought pain to me sleeplessness discontent a craving that grew and grew i wished we had never met you had upset my life i believed that i hated you for it delphine questioned me it was then i told her that i disliked you i meant it i thought i meant it i longed for you to disappear and leave me in peace yet all the time i thought of you more and more your smile whenever we met you smiled and the remembrance of it followed me home wherever i went your face haunted me i planned to go away to travel to break myself loose but it was no use i could not go i dreaded to see you but i dreaded more to go away i hung about the places you might pass that dress with the flounces i could see the blue of it coming toward me through the branches that night you were ill all the colour went out of your cheeks i would have given my life my life i have never loved before i did not know what love meant but you have taught me you have waked me from sleep i'm not good enough a surly brute couldn't expect any girl to care but for seven years twice seven years i'd serve i'd wait oh my beautiful my beautiful if you could see yourself how can i stay here and let you go marry me marry me this week to-morrow 
what are conventions to us i'll be good to you all the love of my life is waiting i've never squandered it away it has been stored up in my heart for you i held up my hand imploring him to stop oh mr maplestone don't it's all a mistake it must be how can you care you know so little of me we have met so seldom how can you possibly know that you would like me as a wife he gave a quick excited laugh <laughs> it's all true what those poet fellows write about love i used to laugh and call it nonsense but when it comes to one's own turn it's the truest thing in the whole world how do i know i can't tell you evelyn but i do know it's just the one certain fact in life i want you i'm going to have you he stretched out his arms as if to seize me then and there and i shrank back looking i suppose as i felt frightened to death for instantly his manner changed his arms dropped to his side and he cried in the gentlest softest of tones don't be frightened of me don't be frightened forgive me if i seem rough rough to you oh my sweet give me a chance to show what i can be you have done enough caring for other people now let me take care of you be my wife evelyn it was all too painful and miserable and yes too beautiful to put into words i cried and said no no i was sorry but i didn't love him i had never thought there was no one else oh no but it was hopeless all the same i could never never oh indeed i was not worth being miserable about he must forget me on wednesday i was going away he would find when i was not there that he would soon forget he looked at me with sad stern eyes that's not true you know it's not true i am not the sort to forget and if there is no one else why should i try evelyn you don't know me if you think one no will put me off i said i would wait seven years and i meant what i said if you go away i shall follow what's this nonsense of leaving no address do you imagine if i choose to look for you you can hide yourself from me he looked so big and masterful that for a moment i felt a qualm of doubt then i comforted myself with the reflection that it would be impossible to discover what did not exist for a period of time evelyn wastneys was about to disappear from the face of the earth the spinster of the basement flat was about to take her place i don't love you i don't love you i repeated helplessly i have never once thought of you except as a a, a rather cross overbearing man who had taken a dislike to me at first sight how can i turn round all in a moment and look upon you as a a lover and i have my friend and my work and we have just taken our house i don't want to be married i couldn't be married even if i cared you are going to be married you are going to marry me what is this work of which you talk a woman's work is to make a home and to help a man find his soul evelyn do you imagine for one moment that i am going to let you go he was himself again self-confident resolute overbearing i took refuge in silence and argued no more have you enjoyed your drive delphine asked was ralph civil it was unfortunate that i had to leave you alone where did you buy your bonnet evelyn i must get one like it for myself does your head ache dear you look quite pale i said it did something ached it kept me awake all night with a dreary heavy pain i lay and thought and thought until my brain was in a whirl had i been to blame in the past honestly i could not see that i had what was i to do in the future must i tell charmian how could i ever return to pastimes round and round the questions whirled in a never-ending circle but no solutions came then i said my prayers and with a special plea for guidance for a very lonely very worried girl and gradually surely i grew calmer i reminded myself that there was no need to worry over the future 
and that all i had to do for the moment was to decide on my duty for to-morrow for everybody's sake it appeared best that i should excuse myself to delphine and escape to town since nothing could be gained by another interview with ralph maplestone i would send him a letter repeating my protestations that i could never be his wife and begging him to forget me with all possible speed when he called at the vicarage to answer it he would find that the bird had fled the early morning sunlight was stealing in at the window i closed my tired eyes and fell asleep End of chapter 15